Need motivation? Watch the top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Ed Milet, and my take on his top 50 rules for success. Enjoy. If you're feeling helpless right now, become helpful. Mm, you, can't, so you can't simultaneously be helpful and helpless. When you can get out of you, you know, ironically, and this is a hard thing to swallow. I did a podcast on ego where I talked about this. You know, if you're feeling anxiety, fear, helplessness, you know, that's your ego Even really? because it's, it's about you. You've made it oh, about yeah. you. If you can get out of you and serve someone else, one of the things Lewis is incredible at is always serving. Hey, I mean, randomly, guys, I'm telling you, he'll be out on a walk video. I see this face. Hey, brother, just thinking about you. Is there anything I can do? But it's not generic either. Like. Please tell me something I can do to help you, to serve you right now. Your identity, it's like a thermostat. I'm in a room right now and the temperature's set on the wall. Your identity is the thoughts, beliefs, and concepts you hold to be true about yourself. This temperature in this room is not based on external temperature outside. It's not the external things in our life that bring us bliss, joy, and abundance. It's our internal identity and it sets the temperature of our life. So if your identity is 70 degrees of money, 70 degrees of happiness, that's what you're going to get. And if you can alter that thermostat setting, it doesn't matter how cold it is outside or how warm it is outside. That regulates the temperature of your life. And that's through your associations, your collaborations, and the things you read and listen to in your proximity. So if you can change that thermostat setting while you're working right now, while you're waiting to go back out, when you get back out there, you'll have a different level of abundance, bliss, happiness, relationships, all of it. Alter that thermostat setting through your, what you're reading, listening to, and who you're hanging around talking to also right now. The model for me is that I, I am about maxing out in my life, but the model for me is that I've learned from the mistakes that I've made, and I'm just, it sounds as hokey as you can be, I'm trying to get better every single day, every decision I make, I just wanna get better because you know what, I, can't con I don't compete with other people, I don't compare myself to other people, this is my life, right? And so the model for me is this, and I just wanna say this to everybody, there's probably a point in your life where you were given a script of who you were supposed to be, whether it's your parents or your friends or your spouse, and we live too often in our lives some other person's script, right? Someone else's script. Remember this, you're the lead character in the story of your life, and the person who controls that script is you and your God. And at any point, you can decide to step into a new chapter. You can step in to be a whole new leading character. And too often, at the end of a movie, you know at the end of a movie there's the credits? Yeah. It's like leading character, leading woman. But if you watch long enough, eventually you get down there, it's like cab driver number two, you know, trucker number three. These face, they don't even have names at the end of the movie, right? Most people live their life worrying about what cab driver number two bouncer number three, tr instead of your life is about those leading characters that those five or six or eight people around you that you love. So my model is I live my own script. My model is I control that script, me and God. I can write a new chapter. I could right now, you, you get off this podcast, you could decide to step out into a whole new character. Maybe not dramatic, maybe you're just a little bit more confident woman, a little stronger, a little bit more dedicated to your focus, a little bit more focused on keeping the promises you make yourself. You just start stepping into that new place. And for me, I write new chapters every year. I don't, I'm not interested in reading the past chapters. My past chapters are either are, are, are stories I've made up in my mind about how great I was or big failure stories we repeat to ourselves. I'm about the new chapter right now, not even the future, right now writing that new chapter. That's my model is I control the script and I know I control the script with God's blessing. One of the things that you, you do, and, and I want to, remind everybody of something. Lewis's show is called The School of Greatness, and it's easy to forget, and maybe no one's told you in a while, but you were born to do something great mm. with your life. And that's easy to forget when you're, you're going, I'm in scarcity mode. I need to survive. I mean, that sounds great, Ed, but like, you don't understand. I'm, I'm unemployed. I'm, I've got rent that I'm going to have to start paying again. I understand that. And I'm saying one of the pathways out is you remind yourself, I was born to do something mm -hmm. great. In yes. big ways and small ways. And some of the <clears throat> smallest great things you will ever do in your life 
are the most important, not the big ones, not the, I had Kobe Bryant on my show, yeah. or I just spoke to 5,000 people, or I made a hundred grand on a sale. I'm talking about the small things that maybe only you and that other person know about. You and I both just had, sometimes our guests overlap, and I love how we approach the interviews differently too. We both just had Nick Vujicic on our shows <laughs> in the last four, five, six weeks. And he's spoken in, I don't know, 75 countries, millions of people. He was born with no arms and no legs. He's a friend of both of ours. And it started because a janitor at his school yeah. nudged him, a janitor at his school and said, hey, I think you'd be a great speaker, a great motivator to people. Now, that man that helped him, that was a small act of greatness. He maxed out that day with that person and he made a difference in the history of mankind. This man spoke to millions of people, saved people from suicide, inspired them for me and you know, yeah. my original business was a financial business. Well, the man who got me involved in that business was never financially very successful, but I was in college. He said, I think you'd be great. And I wasn't interested in Lewis. He'd write me a letter every month. I still believe in you. I think you'd be amazing. Wow. What, I, I think you'd be, and I get these handwritten letters every month, little acts of greatness. Well, because of that, I've been able to reach millions and <clears throat> millions of people. You would say, well, Ed Milet's done some pretty great things. Really? Well, what about Steve Adams, who wrote me all those letters, who got me into entrepreneurship? <clears throat> that little, what if you were that person to curate, in, in <clears throat> Lewis's words, to collaborate? Who could you connect? What, how resourceful could you be right now in connecting other people? Man, you start doing that, this helpless feeling goes away. This self-confidence begins to emerge. And you ironically start to create some momentum yeah. from this place of stagnation right now. I love the book by my brother Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve You Guys. This is the kind of thing you get in this book. Most people wake up and drive to a job they hate. Think about your five closest friends. Are they happy? Do they live their lives with purpose? Do you? We put on a fake front for what we want people to see and think about us, but the reality is most people aren't happy. We're lost. We settle. You can't be happy if you don't know your purpose. And then he goes on to explain how to do that. You guys should get this book, Built to Serve, by my dear friend, Evan Carmichael. Worrying does not take away tomorrow's problems. It takes away today's peace. And I can tell you that one of the things I do, we all have patterns. And one of my patterns is I'm a worrier. I, I, t I tend to worry just like many of you do. So I'm intentional. When you have an awareness of something, it loses its power and impact over you. So when I begin to worry, I am aware of it. And I go, I'm doing it again. I'm doing it again. It almost becomes almost like a comedy routine for me because I realize this pattern that I'm in. So I do what I call a pattern interrupt, which is awareness of this dumb thought projecting into the future, things that probably won't happen that don't serve me. And I always focus on getting present. What can I do right now to bring myself peace, to bring myself joy, to bring myself strength? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to reach out to? How do I need to move my body differently? Oftentimes, if you're moving your body, even if it's jumping jacks or a walk or anything you do, you can't simultaneously be in a peak state physically and be in a negative state emotionally. And so I'm always checking my physiology and moving my body. It's one way to shift right out of worry and into something more productive. What have you guys found is your thing that kind of allows you to balance the two? Like what, what's the groove you figured out along the way to, to at least make the best of balancing the two of life and business? Um, well, for me, to be honest with you, I don't have balance. I mean, I, I, I don't seek it and nor do I have it to be candid with you. I mean, at any given time, you know, there's certain areas of my life that are spiking compared to other ones. And I think just the people around me know that there's going to be times where I'm going to have an abundance of time with my family. And there's going to be times where, you know, I'm just going nuts with work or whatever it is in my life. So I don't really have balance. I don't seek it. I think balance is boring. And I think people that have a ton of balance probably aren't achieving a whole lot or accomplishing a lot or loving a lot. Like I like a little drama. I like a little intensity. I like stress. And so um, I'm not even really after that. So I think people that are seeking that are seeking something, at least for me, I don't know how GC feels about it, but for me, it's not something I want, nor do I know that perfect balance exists for anybody. I mean, I think you're probably pretty balanced when you're dead, but you know, when I'm living and I'm alive, there's just different areas of my life at any given time that demand more of my time or that I'm demanding more of my time in. And so that, at least for me, I don't have it. Have you tried to like in your career, like tried to have it and then figured, ah, like, forget this, it's not working? Or? It's not that I don't, it's not that I'm not aware right. when I need to invest time in something that I haven't been. It's not that I'm not aware of that. It's just I'm not under the illusion that I'm going to get to a perfect balanced state. Gotcha. Um, because I've lived long enough in 
I guess what you'd probably call, call some kind of controlled chaos. I enjoy variety. I like uncertainty. I like not everything being the same every single day. You know, I get asked a lot about routines and things like that. I'm very regimented, very routine person, yet I hope there's different things in my day, different variables, different things every single day. So I think if someone's seeking balance, they're probably chasing the wrong thing, at least for me. That's not what I want. I don't want to be bored. I don't want to know what every day is going to be like. And I like that life calls me to different places and it demands me to be great in one place over another at any given time. Early 20s, I went to a Tony Robbins seminar mm -hmm. and uh, he used to do these things where he'd cure phobias. And so one of the phobias that day was public speaking. And my little team I was in, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. And we get called up on the stage. He made you give a speech. Uh -huh. So like 30 of us get up there and give a speech. And it was just terrifying. I literally almost peed myself. Like I was going to pass out. I was going blank, like in and out of consciousness almost. And then I talked and like, wow. When I was done at the intermission, they said, Tony would like to talk to you. And I walked backstage and he goes, I've not said this before. He goes, I think you might be the most gifted speaker I've ever seen. Uh -huh. Please pursue this. I was like, what? He goes, I'm just telling you, please pursue it. Two years later, I was on stage touring with him. Really? And I think uh, the lesson in that for me was, man, like sometimes on the other side of massive fear, yeah. this isn't a saying either. I mean this. Sometimes on the other side of massive fear is your great gift. Oh, I love that. Or story. a great rewarding. And, and I, I, I stumbled into this because I conquered this monster fear. It's almost like that fear is the barrier to get to, to your greatness. Yeah. And once that went away, and I've had that example happen in a few other things in my life too. So like, I kind of chase fear now. I hate it, yeah. but I chase fear because there's always a gift on the other side. It could be a gift of a reward, but it also could be a gift about you you didn't know you possessed. Yeah. And so I'm something I'm addicted to doing now, but that was probably the, the first example of my life. I went, this is changing now. When you look at someone who you might think is successful, like Lewis or myself, remember it wasn't that long ago that we were right where you are, where we're, is there any money in the ATM when we go there? worried about, you know, being able to eat. It's not, we've both been broke a lot longer than we've been not broke. And so it wasn't that long ago for either one of us. And we both have friends and family that are struggling as well. So um, I'm really sensitive to that. And I've been prayerful and, you know, I've, I've done everything I can from that standpoint, trying to serve like you and I are going live right now. So I don't mean to minimize any of that, but some good news. I just, I have some friends and so do you that have been on both our shows that are pretty well politically connected on both sides. And I will share with everybody that as of this morning, I've been hearing more optimism uh, than I have in a long time from them yeah. that perhaps there's some light coming in terms of being able to get back to work in a modified way, um, maybe in the beginning of May, maybe middle of May, depending upon where you live. And I think that's exciting news. I just watched Governor Cuomo's press conference. He was even talking about those things. <clears throat> and so, you know, I think there's some light potentially at the end of the tunnel. That doesn't mean more dark times aren't ahead. Who yeah. knows in the fall if there's a resurgence or something like that. But I definitely think um, that there's a resurgence. That there's a, something positive coming. One of the things I'm most excited about, everybody, I must tell you, is how I've seen so many people pull together. One cool thing about this, because you're always asking yourself, how is this happening for me, not to me? What yeah. can I learn from this? If you can just control the quality of the questions, because what's thinking? Thinking is asking and answering questions to yourself. So if you can control the questions, you can control the thinking, right? We lose control of our thoughts when we lose control of the questions we ask ourselves. So I'm always every day, what's it teaching me today? What can I learn from it? And the thing that scares me the most is seeing people who don't save money. It blows my mind. I rarely do it anymore, but when we go to the mall on the weekend and I'm watching people walking out of there with six, seven bags and I'm thinking, my God, like you don't need all this stuff. Wouldn't that be cool to put that $200 a month away in savings someday for your children's college, someday for your retirement, someday to buy your dream house. You know, the best thing of living here of living at the ocean or having a jet or other material things I have is I own them all. There's no mortgage on this home. There's no mortgage on my Idaho place. There's no mortgage on my jet. There's no debt on any of my cars. Now it hasn't always been that way, but the way I got there was by saving a bunch of money when all my buddies were blowing theirs on stuff to impress other people that gets dated anyways, right? And so stuff you buy that you think will impress other people is really only cool for the first or second time you wear it or use it anyways. My dad said to me, the best investment you're ever going to make is going to be in yourself. And uh, right when he said it, I knew it was true. I didn't debate it. I knew he was right. My dad's my best friend to this day. He's in his 70s now. And uh, he still tells me that. He'll still remind me of that to this day. At I'm 47 years old, had a little bit of, you know, some beginnings of some success in my life. And my dad still will remind me of that one lesson.
The most powerful way and the easiest way to change your thermostat setting is by adding people to your circle very close proximity that live at a higher temperature in that area than you do. For example, in your faith, let's just say, you're a 75 degree or in your faith. You've already seen this. You can't possibly begin to regularly associate with good, godly people who pray regularly, who try to live righteously, and they're at 110, 120 degrees of, of faith in their life, and not have that proximity heat you up. Now, you won't get to where they are. You'll get to somewhere between where you are at 75 degrees and they are at 110. Over time, you become 100 degree -er, and you alter the thermostat setting through association same in business if you and I were to hang around each other every single day and let's say you were a 75 degree or -er in business hypothetically and I don't know that about you but let's just say you were and I was 150 degree -er, and we hung around each other all the time don't you think through that association right especially if you had two or three or four people like me in your life that just over time you don't even feel it you're at 80 you're at 85 you're at 90 you're at 95 and that's where you are. We understand the power of this with our children because we know at school, the teachers have influence over them, they're mentors, but the people that really have influence over our children are fr their friends because they're around them all the time. And so we know it sets their temperature. This is true in, in fitness. If you're a 75 degree of fitness and every meal, every day at the gym, all your associations, hypothetically speaking, were with someone who was shredded and fit the way you wanted to look at 150 degrees, you know over time you get heated up. And so you can't be with someone every day, you can't be with them all the time, but the key is to get more proximity in the areas that matter with people whose thermostat setting is higher than yours. I am a product. You are listening to me right now because I've been so obsessed with this concept of adding new associations to my life that live in the areas that I want to improve in at higher temperatures than me. It's my obsession to this day. I'll give you a secret. One of the reasons I even do my show is I know that I'm influencing many of these guests in the areas that matter most to them through our proximity and in some cases they do it for me and so I'm obsessed with the power of association but I don't just associate see all personal says yeah you're the five people you hang around kinda you really are the five to ten people you hang around if you're conscious all the time of studying them of observing them of asking questions of the fact that you should be altering your thermostat setting that's when it really moves. It's not just hanging around, it's consciously and intentionally spending time with people where you allow it to impact you, where you study them, where you really observe them, where you're open to their influence. There has to be a level of trust before you can do that, where you surrender yourself to them. But it's not just being around them, it's intentionally being around people that alters that thermostat setting. So power of association is the main way to do it. Listen, guys, it's, not, it's appreciation and intentional appreciation. So one of the things, I'm a crazy list maker. I make lists. Most people I know are kind of people who make lists. That person's blowing your phone up right now. I know. I just and put it on I, airplane bus. Yeah, I, my, mine's doing that too. And so I make lists of stuff I got to do every day. Why do I do that? Well, it reminds me I want to do. But what I do is self-confidence is the process of keeping the promises you make to yourself. You've yes. probably all heard me say that, Lewis say that before. But how do you do that? Well, for me, it's the visual a delivery of it for me. So if, if it says like Instagram Live with Lewis at 10 a.m., um, make sure I text Bedros Kulian back today, whatever it is, right? I've got to prepare a uh, training I'm going to be doing in a week. I'm doing a Las Vegas TV show today. I got to prep for that. And so when I do something and I check the box, I don't just do it. I intentionally go, nailed it, nailed it, mm -hmm. got it, got it. And I start banking these deposits in myself, so to speak, yes. of another promise kept, another promise kept, another promise kept. That's something you could be doing right now. I had a little one last night, bro. I'm going to share something with you. Yeah. Patrick Schwarzenegger and I uh, are pretty good friends. I know you know Patrick too. And and I'm watching Patrick's um, Instagram. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, didn't I connect you guys? I think you you did connect us, dang it. You're <laughs> right. That's actually right. I connected you to Maria Schreiber because he right. said. <laughs> That's right. That's a perfect example of, of collecting. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you just said that. Yes, you did, as a matter of fact. And Patrick's this good-looking model, actor, personal improvement guy, you know, but he's so good-looking. He's like a Lewis Howes lookalike. And, uh, <laughs> but on his Instagram, he's uh, eating ice cream and eating cake every single day. Well, he can get away with it, whatever his metabolism is, yeah. right? And I've been training hard, but you may think this is silly, everyone, but I have had a little bit the last two weeks of an ice cream problem. 
Dude, I had a whole thing, a pint of ice cream last night. I'm with you, man. <laughs> kiss my, dude, I have been plowing ice cream oh, in my so pie good. hole, like so bad. And I'm like, so no matter what I'm doing to work out, I'm like, what is, I never sit around and eat ice cream. I mean, maybe once a month or something, every damn night I'm on ice cream. And so last night, this may seem like a simple promise. I'm not, here's how small life can get when you're in this. I woke up yesterday. It was Easter. I had Easter with my family. And I had to drive back out here to the beach to work today. And I'm like, no ice cream tonight. No ice cream tonight. And it was on my list of things to do that day was don't eat ice cream. And I got here last night and I did my work all day and I do what you do. I turn on Netflix and I'm like, all right, I'm going to catch up on Ozarks for about an hour. Oh my here. gosh. No, I finished which, that in the first two days. Yeah. Right, which, so. is gonna, which is going to turn into eight hours, of course, yeah. right? All of a sudden it's 1 a.m. But about midnight, I'm like, that ice cream sounds damn good oh, right now. Man. And then, just a, and bite, then a, just a couple bites. Just a couple bites. And then I'm like, well, it's 12.05, so technically it's the next day. You know, you start playing these games. <laughs> it's not actually you kept Sunday your promise. anymore. You kept your promise. Yeah. I kept the promise. But the point is, I actually started to walk to the freezer and the refrigerator. You may think this is stupid, everybody. And I went, no. And I turned back around. I got a <laughs> bottle of water, and I sat and watched another show, and then I went to bed. But you may go, that's nothing. To me, that was another deposit in my self-confidence inventory. I'm keeping promises I make to myself, right? <laughs> so these things may seem small, but at 49 years old this month, the reason I have, went from having no self-esteem, no self-confidence whatsoever to where I am now, which is pretty confident, is <laughs> that, is, is that I, I started this <clears throat> process that I know works, which is promise kept, promise kept, promise kept. And these, I've made thousands of these deposits to where when some one thing hits me that rocks my self-confidence, it doesn't take away from the thousands of promises yeah. I've kept to myself. So yeah. just think about that. What are the small things you could be doing? Speed's important and so is certainty. Look, I've made a whole bunch of mediocre decisions that I've executed with intensity and passion and made them win. There's no perfect decision. In fact, an imperfect decision made with speed and complete certainty. You think about in a football game, not every play that's called is perfectly right. is perfectly called, but it's the way you execute yeah. the play with certainty that matters. Not every play call is right. People think, well, the Patriots are the best team in the world because they their play calling is just incredible. Now, nah, I will tell you that the play calling is pretty good. It's the way they execute that play. Even in a bad play call, they find a way to win. And that's what I meant earlier about advice. You got to know you're going to win, know you're going to score, and then ask for advice from that place from a credible source. So those are be those are my two the key to a happy yeah. life see we all know that like you we say hey life happens for you everything that's ever happened negative didn't it end up being kind of something you learned or improved from and you always know it in hindsight yeah. the question is can you begin to live your life in such a way that you know it in present time that as you're experiencing that adversity as you're experiencing the fear in that moment you can accept the truth this is happening for me what uh -huh. a, like my dad driving out here my dad's got cancer mm -hmm. he's in chemo right now yeah and like his third bout what the hell? Could, how is that happening for me? Yeah. How is it good that my dad's got cancer? Because there's a ton of negatives. But candidly, he's had it for a couple of years. It's changed my life for the better. Now, I don't want to lose my father. It's horrible. But the for me part, I take my own relationships with my kids completely differently. When the phone rings now, I'll be honest, when it was my dad before, if I was busy, I'm like, I'll call him back. Yeah. Now I pick it up. Hey, dad. Mm -hmm. My dad tells me he loves me a hundred times more than he ever did before. Yeah. Our relationship's different. Time is precious with him. It's ironically been an incredible gift in all of those other ways. My own health and mortality, I'm more aware of all of a sudden because my dad's going through it. Yeah. So I've embraced this is happening for me, not to our family, even as we're going through this really hard time now. And it's made me happier. There are six human needs. Yeah. Those, and they're not wants, they're needs. There's not eight of them. There's 20, there's, there's six. And these needs, by the way, at any given time, one or two of them are dominant. And the needs are the need for certainty, mm -hmm. right, in your life. Uh, ironically, the need for uncertainty, yep. the, the need for love and connection, the, lead, the need for significance and recognition, and then growth and contribution. So certainty, uncertainty, love and connection, significance, growth, contribution. Those are the six needs. And one of the things we do when we message people when they don't respond is we message them with our needs. Like what Lewis is saying. Yep. I need this. Can you help me? I need a job. I need money. I need a help. Correct. Yeah. I need help with this one question. The second thing is to get me to respond to something when I was, say, 25 years old, 
I had a giant need. So think through what's the need of those six that's dominant for this person yes. I'm messaging. Stay with me, everyone, on this, okay? Because when I was 26 years old or 25 years old, one of my dominant needs was significance and recognition, just like yours was, right? I wanted to be somebody. If you said, hey, you know, I can get you on my podcast. There's a million people listening. I'd be like, whoa, significance, right? So that would be my need. My need, actually, if you were to evaluate me now, is really contribution. Yeah. Growth. So one of the things you could say is you'd help other people. You'd make a difference. Think about what my need might you'd be. You'd impact a million lives if you right. did this 20-minute thing with me. Yeah. Right. You did it when you asked me to come speak at School of Greatness. It was yeah. your, you, you did it sincerely, but it wasn't like, hey, Ed, there'll be a big crowd. It was like, Ed, I really think my family would respond so well to you right now. And I went, I'm in. I don't care what it requires. I'm in because I want to serve. I want to make a difference. My button is service right now. That may change. Maybe in a year, it's certainty. But for right now, it's contribution for me. Contribution and growth are my dominant ones. There are people listening to this who are not wired. It's okay if you were watching this and say, my goals aren't financial. I'll even, I'll accept that for a second. What I don't accept is when people tell me that, but it's not replaced with another obsession that, that would fulfill them. If it's, you know, I want to have a million children get educated, or I want to feed a million people, or I want to, you know, I want to start a charity that does XYZ for homeless women. All those things will take money. Well, those things right. do take money, well, or, or the raising of money, right, right. from someone else. And so I, I find it, I find it that people either aren't clear on what their obsessions are, or when they get them, they're just some arbitrary thing they've set low that they think everybody else would think is a big deal. And so we were just off camera right before we went live and we were both saying to each other, which is just, you know, probably only say to each other is we both really feel like we're behind. We really feel uncomfortable with where we are because what we want to achieve when I've done my show, the number one thing that surprised me, Omar, is in my podcast and my show is when I interview people, some say it on camera, but almost all of them say it off camera. And that is that honestly, this is something people would be shocked by the mega achievers that I have on my show struggle with what I would even call borderline depression. This is a secret I've that most people it. won't tell right. you, I've right? I've seen it on my show as well, yeah. And, and, okay, so you understand They're not this. fulfilled, they're not happy. They made the money, but they don't have a momentum. I think there's lie. an element of that. Right. And I think there's another element that people that are mega achievers have such gigantic standards and outcomes for themselves that they're never quite meeting them. And I kind of like that. I kind of think that having some discomfort with where you are Everyone thinks, I, I think everyone's fantasy is, I want to get somewhere where I don't want something anymore. Listen to me on this. I think a lot of people think, if I could just get somewhere where I no longer feel uncomfortable, where I no longer want something I don't have, where I'm no longer seeking something, what they're really saying is, I'd like to get somewhere where I no longer will grow again, right? I don't want that. I always want to be in a state of discomfort, a state of growth, a state of contribution. And so you better be careful that whatever you set that you're, as you're approximating it, as you're getting closer, that the next one's thrown out there, the next one's thrown out there. We spent the better part of the last two hours, both of us, we're playing cards. We're, what do you want, man? What he makes you happy? He beating me at cards. <laughs> I took literally all his money tonight, as a matter of fact, right? Well, all the money that was on the table. But the point I think I would make to you is that your obsessions are what you're going to get. So be very careful what you choose, make them big, and make sure that there's something that at least at this stage of where you are in your current level of awareness, you believe truly would make you happy, truly would make you fulfilled and be very careful when you set them. And so if that's a million bucks, great. Like we're both at a point now where and we don't mean it in a condescending way right. whatsoever. I know that a million dollars is not a lot of money in this world. Right. Maybe it was a lot of money in 1940, but it's not anymore. People that make six figures and uh, bless their heart that yeah. there are still people walking around that have deluded themselves into comfort and thinking I'm successful because I make six figures. Six figures was a lot of money in 1965, man. Right. This is this 2018, 2019 when some people will watch this. That's not a lot of money now. And really neither is seven figures in income anymore, right. right? And so it's just a matter of you getting aware of what your capacity is. And the more you are aware of how spectacular you're wired, the less you'd shortchange yourself with really small goals. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge believer in the power of intention and awareness. So when these negative thoughts creep in, whatever they are, fear, I'm aware of my own thinking. And once you're aware of a thought, it loses its power to have a feeling over you. Mm -hmm. This is what most people don't understand. So we're all going to have those thoughts like, oh, I'm losing my dad. It's a horrible thing. When you're aware of that negative thought, the feeling loses its power over you. One of the things that I think people need to start to understand is if you don't align your thoughts and your feelings, neither one has any power. There has to be a congruency between what you're thinking and what you're feeling. That's why like for example, 
when people set up all these goals, I'm going to make a million dollars, or I'm going to go to the NFL, or I'm going to be happy, or I'm going to lose 20 pounds. In the moment you're having that thought, if you're feeling that you can't have it, if you're feeling that's not going to happen, your body, which is your unconscious mind actually at work, the feeling overrides the thought and that goal has no power. That's why like when you played on my show, I was going to say this to you afterwards and I didn't. You're talking about how you'd visualize these things happening. One of the things about visualization that happens is if you put yourself in the movie of your life, you begin to feel what it feels like to catch that pass in the end zone. Uh -huh. So the thought is simultaneous with the feeling. So if you can begin to visualize what your goals are and allow yourself to feel it in the present time, and there's the gift I'll give you. If you could already experience gratitude for an event or a goal that has not yet happened, but you can experience the gratitude. So when you'd have these visualizations, you probably didn't know you were doing it when you played, but you're visualizing the catch. You're visualizing the celebration. You're already in a gratitude state about having received the goal you have. Yeah. Now you've aligned in congruence your feelings with your thoughts. Now you're a powerful mf -er. Uh -huh. But what most people do in their life is they either have the conscious thoughts overridden by their like lack. I have never done this before. I'm not going to do it. I've always been 20 pounds overweight. I don't have a million dollars in the bank. And they write down all these goals that aren't linked with the feeling. People say, well, how do I get the feeling? You get the feeling by having gratitude for the event before it's happened. Yeah. So gratitude would be my answer. I'm trying to find the thing I'm grateful for during this event in the present time. I've made a mistake in my life. And that is, it's, it, it's contrary to what I teach. I've not been great in my life at being present. Mm. I've not been great at it. I think a lot of achievers struggle with this. And I go in and out of this mode where if I, went, I was in the, was at the pool yesterday with my kids and I'm looking at them and man, Max is going to college this year. My daughter's like a young woman now, you know, and I wish when they were a little younger that those moments when we were in the pool, when they were younger, I was just with them wow. and not thinking about work and thinking about protecting them and <clears throat> thinking about saving for college and being in the moment and enjoying now, right? Wow. Like really enjoying now. And the moments I'm the most effective, the most blissful, the most joyful spreading it is when I'm the most present. And I've always struggled with that because I'm always dreaming about the future and wanting to achieve in the future. The best me is the one when you're just, me and you are in the backyard, you know, and, Hanging out. Else, and it's just me and you, Lewis. And, and so for me, I'd go back to the 30 year old and I'd say, I want you to achieve, I want you to win. Please enjoy this moment. Please be present right now. The 40-year-old Lewis, with this beautiful relationship you're in now and all the achievement, don't miss now for what the possibilities are in the future. Like, enjoy now. If this moment right now with the corona crisis teaches us all anything, it's like all we really have is right now. Yeah. And the more you project into the future, you know, I said in my post today on Instagram, I said, or on all social media, I said, you know, worrying doesn't solve today's problems. It takes away today's peace. Mm. And, 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 and I, so I, that's most of my posts are lessons for me. So that would be my lesson <laughs> at 30, 40 and 50 is be more present. Be, you can't love yourself. If you're not being yourself, just be you cool. just be present. I love myself, but I don't accept me as I am. Probably. I have very few friends who are like, Hey man, that's the way I am. I'm like, really? You're 50 years old? That's it? And so I think when you hear people say depression, or it, it, I think what it really is, is I just don't accept this version of me. I don't accept that I've, I don't mean to be corny when I say this. I know I've not maxed this out. I know I've not 10 x this. And so it is really true. You've seen it in your interviews as well. And I think that if, we're, if, if what your desire is, is balance, is a million bucks, is comfort. You're just setting something up, man, that is going to be miserable for you, right? You should always be in this state of flux where like, man, I know I can get here. I know I can help this many people. I know God gave me this giftedness to make a difference in the world. All of us, when we were little kids, when we were little Scarlet's age, yeah. we knew we were supposed to do something special. We knew we were supposed to do something greater. Maybe the, our parents or the world or kids at school or whatever, life starts to happen and we forget. It gets further and further from us. And the most enlightened people that I know, the most successful people that I know, the most fulfilled people that I know are very aware of what their capacity and potential is. And so because of that, there's this tension inside them mm -hmm. about getting there all yeah, the time. Right, yeah. And so that's why I don't want balance. I don't want that. I want that guy. And, and the closer I get to that guy, I'm going to want that guy because that dude can help more people. Then the that question dude. is, when's enough enough? Right. That's the next the, question. Everybody asks that. Oh, yeah. When's enough enough? Right. Nunca. I think it's a terrible question. <laughs> Never. Right. It's Never. a guy trying to make sense of where he is. Right. It's actually offensive. It's people in your life saying, 
please conform so you make me less comfortable with my miserable existence. When my friends say that to me, hey man, when's enough enough? It's almost criticism of the fact that I'd like to go to another level. Can you imagine being in a huddle with Tom Brady and the guys, the guys in the huddle go, hey man, we've won 11 games. When's enough enough, Tom? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can you right. imagine saying that yeah. to Kobe Bryant or, or to the leader of the free world, will it be a Barack Obama or a Donald Trump? When's enough enough? Aren't we good? Are you kidding me? Right? Like, Imagine if someone said that to Jesus. Yeah. Hey, brother, when's enough enough? <laughs> it is the most offensive question you could ask somebody, any, any, whatever your religion is, right? Can you imagine asking somebody, when's enough enough? That's an offensive question. Yeah, I think one of the most contagious, we've got the coronavirus thing going on yeah. right now, but one of the things that's really contagious is unhappiness in the world today. You know, the more I interact with people on social media, I do my program, to the extent that people are unhappy is shocking to me. And you know, with the stock market, all the things politically going on right now, you have to really be intentional about what you want in your life. And I think sometimes we think, once I get this car, or I get this relationship, or I get this promotion, then I'll allow myself to be happy. So we delay happiness to this future destination. The fact of the matter is, you're gonna bring you with you when you get to these places. So <laughs> if you think you're gonna be happy when you get into your big mansion, you're gonna be in there with you. And so I always recommend something called blissful dissatisfaction, which is be intentional about getting your happiness now. You don't want a big house. You want a big house because you think that'll make you happy. You don't want a relationship. You do, but you think that relationship's gonna make you happy. What if you could have the tools and strategies to give your the gift of that in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And the hook is, ironically, the more you can feed yourself with happiness and bliss now, the actually more likely you are to get the relationship, to get the house, to get the promotion, to get those external things. My lows of bliss and happiness and joy are much higher than they've ever been in my life. Yeah. But I know the highs could be higher and more consistent. And it's just finding joy in small things. And when you're a big achiever, you have to be very careful that you only link your bliss and happiness to s big things. And the truth is, it's the most simple. It's like right now being with you, like right when I saw your face, like it just it's, it brings me joy. Simple things are actually ironic or what bring me the most happiness yeah. and the most joy. When you really get after something, listen to me total immersion in something, you can become unbelievably proficient at it. That guy who's thinking about quitting, he's not totally immersed. Yeah. He's not totally in. Let me give you an example real quick. My dad's got cancer. You know that. Grant knows it. My dad has something called liposarcoma. I think dad's okay with me saying that now. Three years ago, if you'd have said the word liposarcoma to me, I have no clue what the hell that means. I'm not an oncologist. I know nothing about cancer, right? right. All of a sudden, it became important to me. I became completely immersed in the topic of liposarcoma. I know what causes it, what treats it, what you die from it, how it doesn't grow, you name it, right? I'm not a cancer doctor, but I know a ton about that topic because it became so freaking important to me. If you really want to win, you'll get unbelievable at getting people to believe you believe it. You will be loaded with certainty from product knowledge to belief to skills, and you will be completely immersed with, I believe, no B plan. No other plan, no nothing out, completely immersed in it. Aside from dunking a basketball or hitting a 100 mile an hour fastball, these are things that are limitations to human beings. But average ordinary people every single day succeed in the business of persuading people. There is no limitation to being able to do it except those things. First off, knowledge isn't power. It's potential power. Mm. And it's only powerful when it's applied, as you've said. I actually think the separator for people who apply and don't apply is ego. I really think I don't know everything. I really do want to learn. I do have a level of humility about most things that I'm a student all the time. And when I look at a guy like you and I was listening to all the things you're talking about in your career and how aware you are and frankly how candid you are about things you wish you did differently, it takes a ton of humility. And so I think if you're not applying things, you need to look at yourself and decide whether your ego is involved. You'd say, well, no, I'm just afraid. Ego is fear. Mm -hmm. Ego applies itself in lots of different ways, but probably the fact that you're not applying what you're learning is ego related in some way. You can't be happy if you don't love yourself. Yeah. And you can't love yourself if you're not being yourself. If you can begin to live in congruence with your values, your beliefs, and find a way to serve other people, that's always a pathway to your own bliss, to your own happiness. And that's one thing I've seen, I've watched your videos and follow you, and you say the same thing, mm -hmm. that you are living, you're giving back, you have a purpose and you're giving back to others and that fulfills you. Yeah, for me, I, t I figured it out a little bit later in life. I used mm -hmm. to think, well, I wanna be rich, or I, and I do. There's, I, think, I think having material things 
to some extent can give you temporary happiness mm -hmm. and certainly be able to feed your family and provide education for your family. That's, a, that's an important thing. But I found out finally in my life, you know what really gives me joy? Gives me joy is to, is to help other people, is to serve other people. One thing I think that's not said enough in the world, and I, since we only have a little bit of time, is I want everyone to understand this. You were born to do something great with your life. Mm -hmm. You were. Every single human being was born to do something special with their lives. And the two best days of your life is the day you're born and the day you figure out why. And when you figure that out, and it always it'll be a pathway. If you're listening to this, you want to be happier, begin to think about some of your natural gifts, things that you're good at, that you enjoy doing. How could you use those in the service of other people? I promise you that's the pathway to you being a happier person. I think I had a lot of beat up. I mean, emotional, mental, psychological beat up. I was like, beating myself to death psychologically for decades of my life. And, those are, and the one thing, brother, because I know you've written so eloquently about this for everybody, that started with you acknowledging and realizing a pattern. Yeah. So we have these patterns of behavior, right? And so when you acknowledge a pattern you have that does not serve you, it loses a lot of its power over you just by you seeing it, being aware of it. Like, for example, in business for me, Usually when I'm doing well, there's this really intense version of me. I don't always like that guy, but man, does he produce a lot of results. He, you gets, know what I'm he gets paid. He gets results. He gets paid. <laughs> and, and I'm back sort of in the hunt in a lot of my business in such a way. And that guy's sort of reemerging. Mm. And I've asked my, and there's this part of all of us that think this, that's why I'm successful. Uh -huh. So if I took this intensity away or I took this self doubt away, or I took this anxiety away, I'll lose my mechanism to achieve. We all think this. It's complete BS. Or, You're winning. or, or not to interrupt you, but yeah. or if I take this away, I'll lose the opportunity for girls to want me or have sex with women or to right. lose the weight or to do this if I take this away. Right. We think that's part of our secret recipe when in fact, brother, and you've realized this too, you're in a more blissful relationship now that you were succeeding in spite of those patterns, not yes. because of them. And what they are is they become part of your identity. So you think that's why they produce these results, but you're winning instead of them, in spite of them. And so for me, just when they rear their head, I'm like, I'm doing that stupid pattern again. Here I go again. And it loses some of its power over me. And so you're, you're a million percent right. And that's why I, I feel so such optimism about my life is because – I know, I kind of know me. So yeah. I know when I'm doing that guy. Here he goes, the worrying me. Here he goes, the overreacting me. You're doing it again. And it's almost like a clown show when I do it instead of me going, <laughs> well, that's why I win. I mean, hey, you may not like that guy, but man, hey, man he became a millionaire. Look, look at my view, look at my house, look right. at this, yeah. And then you use these external things to validate your own negative pattern. I finally figured out that I'm not trying to completely convince you of everything I'm saying. I'm trying to convince you that I believe what I'm saying. So I think there's a subtle difference when you're influencing people. People think to close you, I have to convince you to believe everything I'm saying. I don't believe that's true. Mm -hmm. I think I have to convince you that I believe what I'm that's saying. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different level of influence. It looks less like a beggar. Mm -hmm. It looks far more certain, which is level two. Level two is the more certain person will always influence the least certain person. And you know your product. So you should be more certain about it than they are or your program. So a couple things about that. All kinds of things give you certainty, okay? Number one, preparation. Knowing your script, knowing your, knowing your product back and forth, believing in your product back and forth, knowing that you know the words, knowing you know what you're gonna say when they, it's a dance. This is very interesting to me when people struggle at sales. There's only like a certain amount of objections you're going to get in whatever your industry is. You ought to, you already know what they're going to say. It's one of 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 different things. You ought to be ready to respond to them. So most people in sales are professional presenters. They're not professional closers. Mm -hmm. So I, they're great at their presentation. They can't close. And so I got really good at closing because someone's going to close somebody. Either you're going to close me, you shouldn't, or I'm going to close you that you should. Yeah. And so the more certain person's going to win. If you just want to accept that truth, that one, you got to believe that I believe what I'm saying, not that you believe. People buy things all the time and say yes to things all the time that they don't necessarily believe everything about. They believe the person presenting it to them believes it. That's a different level. What's something that, I guess, Ed sitting here right now could go back and tell the, the young Ed, what would, you, uh, what would you say, hey, you should listen to this one? Wow. Um, there's a million things because um, I lack so much confidence. I would have first told myself, hey, man, you deserve to be successful. Uh -huh. This isn't relegated to people different than you. Yeah. I used to think, who are these people that live in these beach houses and have these jets or play on TV in a sport? They're like a different species or something. 
And as I've got to know them all from doing my show and just from living my life, they're just like you <sighs> in many ways. They're just human. They have the same emotions, the same weaknesses and whatnot. But here's the deal, man. Your life, you're probably never going to exceed your identity. Mm -hmm. And that your identity is the thoughts and concepts that you believe to hold really to be true about yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and you have multiple identities. You have a happiness one, a wealth one, a fitness one, a relationship one. And you will never, temporarily, you could get a better result than what you believe you're worth, but you'll find a way to cool it back down. Your identity is like that thermostat on the wall. Uh -huh. It sets the temperature for your life. So if you're a 75 degree, or let's just say of wealth, and you live at 75 degrees, you might get it going for a while in business and you're living at 80, 85 degrees, but all of a sudden the thermostat of your life will kick in unconsciously and you will find a way to cool it right back down. Uh -huh. Reverse is true too. You start going broke, you can't pay your bills. You'll find a way eventually, don't you? You didn't starve, you didn't get homeless, you heated your life back up to what you think you're worth. Yeah. And it governs your life. It doesn't matter the external conditions. If you have a thermostat in this room, 100 degrees outside, it'll still regulate this room to 75. Yeah. And so your identity is a thermostat of your life. And if you don't change the thoughts, concepts, and worth you hold to be true about yourself, all of the other mechanical things you do, you will find a way. Most Hall of Fame athletes simply have a higher identity about their craft and their career. Most high performers in fitness, high performers in a relationship, people in faith, their faith. You see someone just lives with great faith. They've got 150 degrees of faith. And so they get that no matter what the conditions are. There's a woman on my show today, Tony, who was the mother of a five, four, and two-year-old, Kayla Stockline. Her husband was pastor of a church. He hung himself last year in their church, mm. committed suicide, and left three children behind and a loving wife and a church full of people. And on my show, she says that the last year, her faith has only increased and she's closer to God. Mm. How in the world is that possible? It's because no matter what the conditions of her life is, she's got this gigantic faith identity. So my thing I'd go back and tell me is you better work on this identity thing all the time, bro. You better keep working on it or you will find a way to cool your life back down in every area to what you think you're worth and what you think you deserve. Comparison is a formula. Of, that's why social media is so dangerous. Comparison is a formula for misery. And what we do in our life is we compare ourselves to the best day and the best picture on social media that we see of somebody else. We compare ourselves at different times in our lives too. You know, even if you're in a relationship, comparing your relationship in its fifth year to its fifth week isn't fair to that relationship. There's different stages in our life. So comparison is a pathway. There's pathways to happiness and there's pathways that lead us to unhappiness. One of those for sure is comparison. And it's an ego thing oftentimes with us. We're always trying to one up things in our life. It's a matter, I think really, of being more present in the moment in your life and saying, I deserve to be happy right now. People's will to win is easily bought in life. And there's bought, it's bought two ways. He and I have talked a lot about this. He keeps telling me to write this book, but you gotta just ask yourself in advance, here's what people do all the time in business and life, okay? They're constantly negotiating the price they're paying. They're in constant negotiation in their mind. Is this worth it? Can I go through any more? I don't know, <laughs> it's so hard. They're constantly negotiating the price. This zaps your energy, it zaps your certainty, it zaps everything from you. If you're gonna win, negotiate in advance that you will pay any price required that you are not for sale, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral. Once you've done that, when I was poor, I'd walk into stores all the time. I wouldn't buy what I wanted because I was poor. I'd be flipping price tags over. What's it cost? What's it cost? What's it cost? Now, I wouldn't get what I wanted. I'd get what I could afford, right? I'd negotiate the price. Okay, if you do that in your life, you will you eventually be bought. You will either be bought by failure because it's just too big a price or worse. This is the one he's talking about. You're bought by some level of success. You get some price tag, they give you your number and they buy your will to win and you stop getting after, you stop going to the next level. Both are insidious. The obvious one is people who just sell out their will when they're failing. The other one is for the people in here that, oh wow, now you're at 250 grand a year. Oh wow, now you hit your big number, you're at a million, and your will was bought. If you really size up the really top level at anything, they can't be bought. It's like the heavyweight champion. How many guys, it's one thing to win a title. I coach a lot of UFC guys. One thing to win a title, totally different deal, man, to repeat and to repeat again and to repeat again and to repeat again and to go win in another weight class and another weight class. That's a whole different deal. It's one thing to win a Super Bowl. A lot of guys that want a Super Bowl. Totally different deal to win five like Brady. Totally different deal to win six like Jordan, right? Totally different deal. Their will to win could not be bought by the losses or the wins. This is the separator from the best at anything. I want you to write this down. I need to embrace the suffering. 
You know, there's something powerful that once you just sort of embrace the fact that in order to achieve something big, you've got to get rid of these distractions. And then the other layer of it is you're probably going to have to have some suffering to get there or some sacrifice to get there. And so once you've embraced and decided that this suffering, this sacrifice you're making is an indicator of progress, it's an indicator of obsession. Suffering and sacrifice and hard work is an indication of progress towards our dreams. The lack of sacrifice, the lack of suffering in our lives, its removal, its non-existence also equates to a non-existence of a great life, a non-existence of a dream happening, a big one anyway. And so embrace the fact that you're gonna to have to sacrifice and suffer to some extent. Once you've embraced that it's going to happen, it's almost not that bad. It's kind of like those of you that are fit. We already know, and you already know even if you're not, you've sort of accepted that before you go to the gym and get there, you're gonna to have to suffer. And we go anyway, it becomes a habit. No one goes into a gym thinking, I'm not gonna to have to sacrifice or suffer. There'll be no discomfort or no pain. But millions of people go anyway, don't they, to the gym. On some level, they're suffering in the gym, whether it's breathing heavy or sweating or aches or pains or stress. You know, everything in the gym is a sacrifice and to some extent, you're suffering, going through some pain. You know it before you go, don't you? Yet most of us go all the time. Yet in life, outside of that one area, most of us, we're worried about suffering, we're afraid of it. it. When we're suffering and sacrificing, we wonder whether it's worth it. We wonder whether we're supposed to. We wonder whether sacrifice or setbacks or suffering is a sign it's not our real dream, don't we? See, at the gym, you'd never think, oh, I'm going through some pain and discomfort. This must be a sign I shouldn't be at the gym. You'd never think that. It goes with the territory. Everyone knows this. Build a bicep or a tricep or a chest or legs. You have to break it down, suffer and sacrifice for it to grow. So while it's happening, there's no part of you that says this isn't right. In fact, the indication of the pain and sacrifice and sweat, don't you feel better at the gym? You're like, wow, I really sacrificed today. I really suffered. So in that area, we all know to the extent we suffer and sacrifice is to the extent we grow. And your body is a metaphor for the rest of your life. But the rest of our life, every time we sweat, every time we sacrifice, every time we suffer, we don't do what we do at the gym. We start saying, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. Maybe I'm not cut out. Maybe it's not my destiny. Maybe I just can't do it. I have a show where I interview kind of top achievers, and, you know, athletes, entertainers, business people. And when I started the show, I thought it's going to be fascinating to find out what they all have in common. Mm -hmm. Is it hard work, brilliance, charisma? Mm -hmm. And frankly, it's, un it's a skosh of unhappiness mm. because achievers, even people like yourself, and this is people that are, that are out there like that too, should consider this. We have this thing where we're really never living up to what we think we're capable of. And that's a good thing because it's, it pulls us to get better, but it can also be a formula for misery if you never just decide. You know, a lot of achievers think, well, if I enjoy this moment right now, I'm gonna lose my drive. I'm gonna lose my ambition. So they cheat themselves for all of the joy all of the, the juice that comes from winning. And I found if you give yourself that dopamine hit when you achieve something, you allow yourself to enjoy it, your brain wants to do it again and again yeah. and again. But if you rob yourself of it, that's when burnout starts to happen because you're not giving yourself any of the, the rewards for your hard work. I was an ego-driven person when I was young. And by mm -hmm. the way, I still fight it. I think all successful people yeah. are constantly towing constantly. that line of ego constantly. and strength, right? Yeah. So I still, I still do. Anybody around, my wife would definitely tell you, trust me, he's not always winning that battle. However, a great gift happened for me. Again, my dad's drinking. My dad got sober that year and he was at an AA meeting uh -huh. and I was unemployed living at home after college with my parents. Same bedroom, same teddy bear, same posters, mm -hmm. losing. And my dad comes home from an AA meeting and he goes, I got you a job. 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, you show up at McKinley home for boys. I'm like, what is it? He goes, I have no effing clue. Get your ass down there and start making some money. Yeah. I go down there at 6 a.m. I'm like, hey, I'm here. I didn't know what it was. What it ended up being was an orphanage. It's a group home, but a huge one, campus, like 50 different cottages, all boys of all ages. All the boys were wards of the court. Family died, incarcerated, or had molested them. Yeah. I'm like, I'm here for the job. They're like, what job? I'm like, I don't know. Just I'm here. They're like, well, come back when you know what it is. And I get to the door and I'm like, the guy's name was Tim that was going to hire me. They're like, we don't know Tim. And I start to leave and I go, well... I think he's an alcoholic because he was at an AA meeting with my dad. So I think, oh, drunk Tim, cottage eight. <laughs> drunk Tim. Drunk Tim. <laughs> and I walk into cottage eight and my life changed. Uh -huh. Seriously, man. It was all little eight to 10 year old boys and they stopped when I walked in and they had these eyes. Mm. All kids who come from a little dysfunction in their life have different eyes. Yeah. They want to be loved. They want to believed in. They want someone to coach them and lift them up and show them how to be better. 
and they stopped and I instantly became their dad and their big brother. I'd take them trick or treating. I was there when they opened their Christmas presents. I was there on their birthday and it changed my life because I was like, holy shit. I love helping people. Mm-hmm. I love this. Like I like it more than hitting a home run. I like it more than money. And so when I was there, I kind of changed. Yeah. And then while I worked there, the financial company that I ended up having my first success in came along. And I honestly can tell you, man, I went into business with this idea that I'm going to love people, believe in people and coach them. And I'm still doing it to this day. I yeah. did not go into business to make big money. I went into business to serve people. I went into business to help people. And so that was the flipped switch for me was I got out of me and I got into them. Yeah. And when you're into you, it's like you're constantly thinking all the time about what they're thinking about you, what you need to say, all this stuff. Even when you're on TV or camera, sometimes just get, I just serve people, just yeah. contribute. Influence in life isn't even that people even need to believe what you're saying. This yeah. is what's crazy. People think, I got to get people to believe me. And when you get to try to get people to believe you, you come across like a beggar. You come across desperate. Influence is not people believe me. Influence is that people believe you believe what you're saying. Uh They don't have to believe what you're saying. They have to believe you believe what you're saying. Uh And so I switched that. When I went into business, I'm like, I'm not going to always try to get people to believe everything I say. It's too much work. I can't do it. It makes me nervous. I'm going to get people to believe I believe it. And then you know what? That's tremendous influence. It says, I want to help you, but I don't need you. Yeah. And so that was a, a key switch for me. And then I just started going nuts into personal development, reading books, trying to find mentors, get anybody I could to go to lunch with, pick their brain, ask them questions just to change me. So uh-huh. that's where it flipped for me. I'm such a massive believer in certainty and you get what you obsess about that I found myself lately, and just just as candid, like lately, um, knowing I need to even be more specific and more clear about not only what I want, but why I want it. And so I'm at a stage right now where I'm I'm building my recipe and my formula. By the way, I executed a thousand miles an hour whether I'm ready, <laughs> but I at the same time, I'm executing and navigating right now exactly specifically what I want for the next 10 years of my life and why I want it. Because um, at the end of it, people say all the time, well, material things, they don't make you happy. You ever hear somebody say that to you? Yeah, and that's just completely a lie. I mean. Have you ever bought a nice dress, ladies? It made you happy when you bought it, right? Or guys, you got a nice brand new car. If that made you happy, it doesn't fulfill you, but it can certainly make you happy, right? And so so for me, I know that those things can make me happy, but I've had a lot of happy. <laughs> I want to be completely fulfilled. And so I'm navigating in my mind, what exactly is it the next 10 years of my life that's going to fulfill me, uh, not just make me happy? Because our jets are amazing, great cars are amazing, but they're less amazing over time. What's never not amazing is serving people, making a difference, contributing. What's never ends for me, what never I get tired of is making a difference in someone else's life, of thinking my life has meaning to another person. And so I'm navigating in my mind right now, and I'm struggling a little bit with exactly how do I reach the most people the best way, and why do I want to do it? The coins flip on each other all the time, don't they? Another form of distraction is just doubt, and doubt comes from the suffer, it comes from a loss, it comes from fear, it comes from the sacrifice. And so just remember this, you're supposed to suffer and sacrifice. So let me ask you a question. What are you willing to risk in order to make your dream come true? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. You're gonna take a risk, maybe it's financial. Maybe it's a risk of time. Maybe it's a risk at your job. Maybe it's a risk of looking bad. Maybe it's a risk of failing, of falling on your face, of going broke, of going through pain, of going through anxiety. Maybe it's even a risk in a relationship that's just gonna be difficult while you do this. What are you willing to risk in order to win? And you have to accept that because remember what I'm gonna tell you. The price you will pay for not making your dream come true is far greater than the one that you will pay to make it come true. Want me to say it again? The price you will pay, the suffering you will go through to make your dream come true is incredibly small, infinitely smaller than the price you will pay if you never do. You'll pay that one the rest of your life. And so ask yourself what you're willing to risk. What's the price you're willing to pay? When you start to figure out what some of your real gifts are, because you were all born with them. We were all born with natural gifts. It could be your intellect, your beauty, your humor, your intensity, your work ethic, your faith you know, your problem solving skills, whatever it is, you're all born with a few, your nurturing skills. When you start to figure out, these are kind of two or three gifts that I do have. And then you figure out in your life how to apply those gifts in the service of other people, you're a fulfilled human being. Mm. There'll probably be a lot of money come from it too. 
But those are the two things people say, how do I become more fulfilled? If you look at your heroes in life, the vast people, I don't know what my gifts are, but who are some of your heroes? And when you start to look at your heroes in your life, you will find that even though their personality may be different than yours, what you really connect with them is they share similar gifts of yours, even though you don't think they do. Uh -huh. So even a great coach you've had, whatever it might be that they just cared about you deeply or they were so detail oriented. One of my heroes is Martin Luther King. I did my thesis on him in college. Well, what do I have in common with him, right? Uh -huh. African-American guy, civil rights movement, preacher. But it seemed to me that the things I, I, I connected with his gift to communicate. Uh -huh. I connected with his gift to serve people and move people and contribute to people. And those gifts are things that you kind of intuitively know are buried deep in you when you look at your heroes mm -hmm. and you'll use them differently in your own life. And so one, find your gifts, two, use them in the service of other people. And if you don't know what your gifts are, start to study your heroes and what are the things you actually really admire about them. You might even admire about them just their integrity. And that'd be one, be one of your gifts or their faith or their strength or their ability to overcome adversity, their toughness, right? Those are things that you know to be true about you. That's why you see them in them. So yeah. why you acknowledge them so deeply. You recruiting the lifeblood of every single business. And um, the first thing you, I, I would just say is that you got to sell a big enough dream that the dreams of everybody you're ever going to have involved in your organization can fit inside the one you're selling. So most of these entrepreneurs out there don't sell it big enough, don't talk big enough, don't think big enough, and aren't intending to do big enough. And so your message is so small, nobody can fit inside it. They got These people you're talking to, they have ambitions and dreams and hopes mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm, you got to mm -hmm. sell a big enough one that theirs can fit inside the one you're selling. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing, man. It's got to be repetitious. You have to say it over and over and over. You can't get tired of saying. Here's an old adage that I'll, I'll give to you. P leaders are always trying to say new, th new things right, to old people. Okay, don't do that. Say old things to new people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Keep getting mm -hmm. new people. Keep saying the same thing over and over again and get new people mm -hmm, all the mm -hmm, time, right? Mm -hmm. That's a huge factor and be repetitious with it. We often talk and hear speeches in WFG, myself included TFA, about identity and belief and leadership building and how we think and being positive and hard work and all these intangible things. But at the end of the day, it's the tangible things, it's the real things that make businesses grow or die. In our business, it's the ability to get somebody to produce a result, or what I call closing. Closing's a nice way of saying, or a harsh way of saying, I guess, getting people to do things that are in their best interest, persuading people to say yes. And in our business, if you can't persuade people to say yes, you're going to lose. In our business, it's yes to the opportunity and yes to our financial products. And at the end of the day, what our business comes down to is, can you close? Can you get a check? Can you get people to say yes to you, to buy a product from you or to buy our business from you? And then from there, it's your proficiency level, your ability to transfer that skill of closing people to other people. And if you can't do it, you're going to lose. It's the number one skill, it's the number two skill, it's the number five skill, it's the number 10 skill in our business. I don't care what list you have, it's by far the most important thing, and it's the most important thing multiplied by 10 times other things you could come up with. The ability to get people to say yes, the ability to give a presentation at the end of it, they say yes. The ability to overcome objections when someone says the basic things in our business. I want to think about it. It's too much money. I don't want to be a salesperson. I read something on the internet. I want to talk to my wife. Is this network marketing? Whatever the questions are, the objections you get, your ability to overcome them and move to yes. If you can't do that, you're going to lose here. If you can't train people to do that, you're going to lose here. If your meetings don't train people to do that, people will stop coming to those meetings. We spend way too much time. My hallucination is you and your office spend way too much time on motivating, inspiring speeches instead of teaching. Instead of actually getting people to do our craft, to become professionals, get yourself to do it. You think about it, if you drew a line in the sand, you said these are all the people in our organization's history that have gotten a check or have gotten to SMD. And then on the other side are all the people who didn't get to SMD or have never gotten a check. What do all the people who've gotten a check or let's just say got to SMD, which is just a basic level in our company of proficiency, have gotten to that level, what do they all have in common? Well, not a lot. Some of them are smart, some of them aren't so smart. Some of them are uh, Caucasian, some of them are Asian, black, Hispanic, you name it. Some of them are tall, some of them are short, some of them are men, some of them are women, some of them are immigrants, some were born in our country. They don't have a whole lot in common. Some are married, some are single, some are old, some are young. What do they have in common? They can all close. 
They can all get a yes, or at least at one time in their career, they developed the ability to give a presentation. At the end of it, somebody said yes. They knew the words. They knew how to say. They knew what to say when someone says, "Well, give me some time. Let me think about it." Or, "Is this too much money?" Or, "You know, I read this." Or, "Is this network marketing?" Or, you know, the basic stuff, right? They're not mysteries. There's only about eight or ten things people say to us to object. There aren't eight hundred. There's eight or ten basic ones. And when you can overcome those things and give a presentation, you win. We know they can do this because we wouldn't have sent them a check without their ability to do it. I'm positive they can do it at one point because we sent them a check. All these other people over here who didn't make it, didn't get a check, or didn't get to S&D, what all them in common? Some are smart, some aren't so smart. Some are black, some are white, some are Asian, some are Hispanic. You get the point. Some are tall, some are short. They got all, they got all that in common too. What do they all for sure have in common? They can't close. They can't get a check. That's why we never sent them one. That's why they quit. That's why people quit on you. Be very clear. People quit on you or you will quit based on your ability or inability to close. When you can close, you're going to do our business. And when you can close and then you can teach people how to persuade people, which is closing, you're really going to build something significant. Start from nothing. Stop for nothing. What does that mean? Well... I didn't come from a whole lot, but one of the things I've seen in my life, and it's one of the things I admire, just why I asked you off camera, what, what are you doing now, right? Uh -huh. You're doing this and all these other things you have going in your life. So I, I started from really nothing in my life, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to stop for anything. And what I find that most people do, and the reason I won't stop is because there's this incongruency between that identity thing I said earlier, what I think I'm capable of and where I am. I've never felt like, actually, I know I've not really accomplished a whole lot yet. I've not really arrived and the thing that I think is the saddest in life is when people don't work on their identity and all of a sudden their results do catch what they think they're worth. That's a formula for death because you're only growing or dying in life. Once you start to exceed or catch what you think you're capable of, you stop growing and you stop. And that's when things get real dangerous in life. It's like an athlete that retires. It doesn't find the next thing. All of a sudden, these guys are running around the gym every day. They got nothing to do. Yeah. Idle time. And they start self-destructing. It's every career. It's not just athletes. And so what that means for me is my motto is, I want to always be improving, always be growing. I always want to feel like I haven't quite made it, that there's what I'm capable of and where I am. That incongruency is this magnet that keeps pulling me forward not to stop. And I don't want to stop anymore. Like, I'm loving doing this right here, right? Yeah. I could be sitting on the beach. So could you. We could both be just doing nothing, which is what people think they would do uh, when they get uh. to that point. And some people do, and they're miserable. They might enjoy it for a week or two or six months. But the fact of the matter is you can't live that way. I want to always be not stopping and growing. That's yeah. what that means. You have to create a culture and a mission and a cause for your business, okay? If you don't have that, people will do a ton for money. That's the number one driver. But people also do a lot for the mission, the cause, that especially millennials. Ironically, a lot of young people now want to be a part of something that's cause and mission oriented. And then what he said is a fact. You better build a winner. People want to play for the Lakers, man. People want to play for the New York Yankees. They want to play for the Patriots or the Cowboys. They want to play for Facebook or Google, okay? You build a winner, people will come. The way you build that winner is by selling a big enough dream. And then here's the other thing. You can't BS people. You can't just talk. You got to back it up with your own effort, your own example. People know what you're saying is valid when you're congruent. Like, we're going to do these big things. They see you crushing it. it means it's true, okay? Then you create that, that environment. When I went to your place, I walked in for their sales meeting, and I knew, already knew he sold it big, 10X, right? I already knew that. But then we walked in, immediately, there's like this environment. See, you recruit to an environment, yeah. right? The, the, the environment is what gets people, your message and your environment. I walked in there, when my, I told him, I said, this is the best environment I've ever seen in a sales company. And his organization is? Unreal. 50 times bigger right. than mine. And mine, you can't see it because it's spotted all over the place. This, you walk in there, I was like, my God, the energy, the enthusiasm, the reverence they had for Elena when she spoke that day, and for Grant, the enthusiasm level and energy, and how committed the people were in that space to what they were trying to accomplish at any given time. Massive accountability, massive accountability. I went, this environment's bananas. Now, what you'll do is you'll still pour through people in a bad environment, but when you do get a thoroughbred, when you do get a rainmaker, when you do get a stud, they get into your environment, you can max them out. If you don't have that environment, man, you get a thoroughbred, they leave. Yeah, exactly. They don't stay if you don't have that environment. Yeah. That's why the environment's so huge. So I was just visiting about this topic with my kids, and I thought you and I ought to visit about it too because it applies so deeply to business. And that's the concept of belief and how that impacts our performance in everything in our lives. And I want you to think about belief for a second. See, if you're a good person, and that's really where this applies is to good people, 
But good people will only let themselves in almost any endeavor, any activity, good people only take from it that which they believe they deserve. Now, bad person, they'll always take more than they deserve because that's what people without character do. But good people, and I hope you consider yourself a good person, they'll only take from something that they think they deserve. Let me give you an example. Let's say there was a pizza here. We were going to serve. There's 12 people here. There's 12 slices of pizza. Well, you know how you'd react in any good person. They'd either wait for everybody else to get their piece or they'd only take one slice because they know that the other people there only would have one left for them. Bad person, they'd just take any time they want to, wouldn't they? So a good person will only take from any scenario that which they think they deserve. And that's a good thing. It's also a bad thing. Because ultimately what it comes down to in business is, is really this. When it comes to your business life or becoming affluent, saving money, getting financially independent, you'll only take from your life and from your business that which you think you deserve. And so really, almost more important than strategy is an internal identity. It's an internal belief that says, I deserve this. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to have this dream come true. I deserve to be financially independent. I deserve to be in the top 10 in my business. I deserve to be number one. Or my team deserves to. My family deserves to. And once you believe you deserve something, then you've at least opened the door to walk into the room of success. But prior to believing you deserve it, you can do all the work, all the calls, all the mechanics that the other people do. But if you don't believe you deserve it, you're never going to even walk into the room and sit at the table to have a chance to get your piece. The, the chair at the table, the space at the table is only reserved for those who believe they deserve to be sitting there. I've never said this on a show before, but a thought occurred to me when you were talking because you remind me of other people who have said this. You deeply love your children, and I think everybody listening to this does. You know what, if you just erased everything today, you guys, every show you've listened to, the most successful people I know, and by the way, you're the first person that made me have the thought, just because I feel how much you love these two children of yours. They harness love more. They harness the emotion of love. They almost leverage love yeah. to go do something great, because if, if love is the most powerful emotion in the world, Right, if that's what it is, you have to harness that and leverage it to go do something extraordinary because that's the, the overriding thing in this man's mind and heart all the time, all the time. When he leaves here and he's driving to San Diego with Lisa, right? When we're in the middle of the interview for a moment, right? All you parents relate to this. When he was driving over here this morning, one of the first things he thought about this morning, before he went to bed last night, was Brody and Brianna. So, but some of you don't harness that. It's almost like you love them and then you set them aside when it's time for business. Right? Don't do that. Harness that power of that yeah. love, right? It'll give you strength and confidence. Here's what most people want to do in their life. And this is a mistake I'll warn you of from the very beginning. They want to get to be successful so they can stop doing the work. Uh -huh. They want to get to a point where they're like, then I won't have to do what got me here. Then I won't have to grind. Then I won't have to be as hungry. And the truth of the matter is the minute you do that, you're dying. I just, I've made that mistake. So I don't have this illusion that the next level I get to, I can stop doing the things that got me there. It's really simple. You had a play, you had a recipe that produced the success you've got, okay? Whether that's some of your anxiety, your work ethic, the, whatever you did in your life. Okay, if you're trying to escape the work, if that's your goal, you're going to lose long-term. I've just accepted that I'm gonna be doing some form of really hard work all the time. And once I made that negotiation with myself done, Life's a lot easier. I've accepted I'm going to have to suffer to some extent, not tons of pain, but there'll be some suffering in order to win. Being that you guys play the game at this level, I'm curious, you know, what's the biggest misconception that you guys found about what it takes to actually achieve the dream, or at least this level of it, versus what you thought it would actually take? And the reason I'm asking is because there might be an audience out there watching this that aspires to be where you guys are at, and they might be thinking inaccurately about what it takes. Can you speak to that at all? M yeah, mine was that I needed to be prepared for every next level. Like somehow everything was preparation. I had to be completely ready for the next one, then I'd be completely ready for the next one, and then I'd be completely ready. And that's just not how it's worked. I got prepared a couple times and I was ready, but there's a whole bunch of times I was completely ill-prepared and we just charged into the, the dark space, right? We just went to that next place unprepared. We would figure it out when we got there. I had this philosophy and this thing in my head that I'd always sort of be able to be ready for the next space and we'd have the perfect plan every single time. And that was almost never the case. Right. We've just sort of moved into the next level and we've achieved things and seen things and gone to places. I've sort of surrendered that, yeah, I gotta have a big old vision and I'm really big on that. I've also sort of surrendered to the fact that I'm gonna enter some spaces, man. They're gonna show me some things eventually that I'm not even thinking about right now. 
and I'll see them from where I go. And so that was a huge misconception of mine that everything needed to be prepared for. I needed to be ready for every single one of them. And uh, absolutely not the case at all. Tell me about this attitude, that everything that we're talking about and then this age that we're in with social media mm. and the criticism that comes with being, uh, in, not even in the spotlight. I mean, mm. yeah, you and I, we, mm. have, we have people that follow us. Mm. But just like my kid, he's 18 years old. He's mm. got a social media account. And I see him getting depressed, whether he wants to admit it or not. Yes. How do you combat that uh, with, with, with everything that's going on with technology? How do you keep it's, a good emotional stability? It's the number one worry I have for my kids and myself. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, I'm not concerned with criticism because of the space I'm in. I don't catch too much, but it is an addiction. It's an addiction to checking your phone. It's an addiction to looking at things. Bullying at school is way different than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you get bullied at school, you could escape at home. Now you get bullied at school and you get home and you're being bullied on Instagram. It stays on social media. It's all the time. The biggest thing that people need to realize, and this is what I try to do on my social media, I try to show my crappy days. Uh -huh. I try to show the days where I'm not doing well. Fact, ironically, it's the most engaged post that I make. Because you're catching everybody on their best day. Everybody's filtered. Everybody's showing you only the good thing. I was at a restaurant last night. There was this family screaming. The dad was pissed. This was last night at the sushi place. The dad was pissed. The wife and him didn't even make eye contact most of the meal. And the kids were a zoo. And I got kids. There's a certain way my kids misbehave. But then there's a point where we're in public. It's like we're cleaning this up as a family. Right? Yeah. They were a zoo. And uh, I'm sure they're wonderful people. Yeah. And then he asks the waiter, the <laughs> server, to take a picture. Uh -huh. You'd have thought they were the Brady Bunch in this picture. It's like, ding, everyone's hugging, uh -huh. everyone's smiling. It was completely perfect in stage. He gives them the camera back to freaking mayhem at the table, right? Uh -huh. And so I've just really taught my kids, hey, listen, none of this stuff is real. None of it's real. Everybody's on their worst day. And if you really want to serve people, show them your bad days. Show yeah. them the things that aren't good. In business, you can become a lot happier person if you begin to listen less to what people tell you they're going to do and focus much more intently on what they actually do. Um, it's interesting, you have friends all your life and then you go through an event like this and you learn who your real friends are. Any of you that have ever been through a trial in your life or a difficult time, in my case it was a health issue recently, um, it's during those times when people actually physically step up and show you that they're your friend um, that you learn the most about them. It's not someone telling you I love you or hey buddy, you know, care about you. It's when you need them, are they there? It's what they do. Friendship is an action. It's an active thing. It's not a state of being. And and I learned a lot this last month or so about, uh, you know, some folks frankly surprised me that reached out and were there for me and maybe people I didn't even know would be that don't always verbalize it, but physically they're friends. And then there's other people that, you know, you've probably had this happen too, that you go through an event and uh, you're surprised by those that don't, that uh, weren't there, that didn't call, that... Uh, didn't seem to care. And so you learn a lot by what people do. I've learned who my real friends are uh, the last few weeks. And it's been a great experience. I have more friends than I thought I had, which is a good thing. But there were a few folks who I thought were my friends, and maybe they're not. And they certainly didn't act like friends. So, But how does that relate to business? Well, you know, you get let down an awful lot by people by listening to them. You know, I've been training people now for 20-something years. And, boy, I tell you, people talk a good game. People tell you, hey, this is my time. I'm going to get five of these this month, or I'm going to write ten of those, regardless of the business you're in. If you're training or leading people in any way, or you're on a sales organization, or if you're part of our organization, people talk constantly. And if you're if you're not careful, you begin to actually listen to them. You begin to actually believe what people tell you they're going to do, or how they actually feel. All you've got to really do is watch what they do. Um, what you do speaks so loudly, I can't hear a word you're saying. And you need to embody that yourself in business because you start to do you start to act differently based on what people tell you. If someone tells you, "Hey, I'm feeling great. I'm going to do big things," maybe you don't do as much yourself, or maybe you don't go get that next recruit, or maybe you don't go get right that extra sale or fight for that extra inch because of what other people have told you they're going to do. And furthermore, sometimes even leading people, don't listen so much to what they tell. People are going to tell you what you want to hear. People tell you, I feel great, things are good. Well, the truth is, what did they do last month? How much money did they make? How much business did they write? Because that's really going to indicate whether they're going to be with you long term 
or not. I mean, if someone's not making money, if they're not recruiting people, if they're not writing a lot of business, they're on their way out the door, not on their way staying. No matter what they tell you, I'm in for life, I'm committed, you can depend on me. The bottom line is, what did they do last month? How much money did they really make? What did they really save? Are they actually behind on their bills? Are they current on things? And so pay more attention to what people do than what they say, and you will have a much better barometer of what's really going on in your business. Hard work matters. Why is hard work matter? Well, hard work matters strategic because if you make more phone calls, you do the old adage, right? Show up earlier than everybody else, leave later. But there's something more deep about that. Yes, making more phone calls, seeing more people, being more active, being busier, putting in more hours into something always gives you a strategic chance to be more successful in because you've increased your odds. You've talked to more people, you're more likely to get more prospects, you're more likely to get more clients or recruits or candidates for your business. So yes, strategically that increases your chances. But something powerful happens when you do things other people aren't willing to do. You begin to believe you deserve to have things other people won't have. And that's what gets you a seat at the table of success. Now once you're there, it's a dogfight. It's a dogfight of skills and talents and luck and faith and circumstance and blessing and all that stuff. But the just to get to the table, to get into the room, you have to believe you deserve to be there. And so again, I want to say this to you. The hard work part plays into shifting your identity. That over time, not even that long a period of time, when you're doing the things others are unwilling to do, you begin quietly to begin to believe that, oh, I deserve to be rewarded in ways these other people aren't going to be rewarded because I'm doing the things others won't do. And so the fastest way to change your identity, to change our belief, is just to flat get to work, to flat get there earlier, to flat leave later, to just make more calls, see more people, be more relentless, just pour ourselves into the work because actually the hard work can in reverse impact our identity. And that's what begins to happen. When you start to do those things they won't do, you begin quietly to change your belief, that you begin to believe, oh, I deserve to sit at the table with these other people who do the things other people aren't willing to do. I have this very weird belief system. I'm a person of faith. I believe that when I go to heaven, I want the Lord to go, well done, good and faithful servant, right? But I also have this other hallucination, and I believed it for many years. I think the Lord introduces me to the destiny version of me. I think he's going to go, welcome to heaven. I'm proud of you, good and faithful servant. By the way, meet Eddie, your identical twin. This is the man I made you to be, what you were capable of, the memories you could have, the contributions, the experiences, the moments. This is the person I made in my image that you could have been, could have seen the things, done the things, become that man. My ambition in my life is when I meet that dude, we're identical twins. Okay. Where I go, dude, I've been chasing you all my life. And he goes, you caught me, dude, great life. Mm. To me, that's heaven. Hell is you meet that person you were capable of and you're complete strangers. Yeah. And so every decision you make in your life is getting you closer to being that man or woman or further away. To me, it'd be hell to meet who I could have been and I know nothing about them. Uh -huh. That to me is not an existence I want to have. I want to tell you one thing that I, I think also those of you that are achieving, we talk about fast earlier and not slowing down. When you slow down and when you're successful, when you start letting yourself sit around and thinking is when you start making all your mistakes. When you let off the accelerator in your business, it's not just letting off the accelerator in your business. You allow all kinds of other distractions mm -hmm. and crap to enter your life and you're doing stupid things here and another dumb mm -hmm. thing there. You need to be at full speed, man, because when you're not at full speed and you slow down, there's all this stuff that starts to happen to achievers because most of us can't sit around and rest and we just get occupied in crap that doesn't serve us. Investments, activities, endeavors, indulgences, whatever they are that don't serve you when you let off the accelerator. So keep going fast. One of the great distractions of chasing our dreams is this thing that goes off in our head as we're negotiating the price we're paying. Should I keep paying it? Is it getting too high? Is it too much? And you'll have people in your ear, it's too big a sacrifice, you're going through too much. And you begin to negotiate it in your mind, it distracts all your focus. You can't be executing and negotiating simultaneously. If you're in your head negotiating and negotiating and negotiating, you can't execute. So negotiate it now. Negotiate it with me now. What are you willing to pay? For me, when I'm after something big, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, I'll sacrifice everything else. But I will not sacrifice anything legal, anything unethical, or anything immoral. But beyond that, I'm gonna get it. 
And I know that negotiation comes up front. I accept the suffering. I accept the sacrifice. I know the sacrifice is far smaller than the one I'll pay if I don't do it. And I eliminate distractions and I go freaking get what I want in my life just like you can. And this needs to be your recipe as well. If you're one of these people who's still negotiating whether it's worth it, maybe you've got someone in your head making you question it. That is a poverty and scarcity mentality. Let me prove it to you. When I didn't have money and I spent most of my life with none, just like you, what do we do when we go into a store? We don't go get what we want, we go get what we think we can afford. And so I spent the majority of my life flipping price tags over. I didn't buy the shirt I wanted, I buy the one that I could afford. I bought things based on price, not worth. And so I'm sure you do, I didn't buy the car I wanted, I bought the car I could afford. So when I was broke and I had scarcity, what do you do when you're in that position? You negotiate price, you flip price tags. What's it cost, what's it cost, what's it cost, what's it cost, not what do you want. When I was poor, everywhere I went, flip the price tag, what's it cost, what's it cost, what's it cost, what's it cost. I was constantly negotiating the price for everything in my life. You do that when you come from a place of scarcity, of being poor. Successful people and wealthy people have a subtle distinction. They don't look at price, they look at worth. Is this worth it? If you're constantly looking at the price tag, you'll eventually relent. You'll eventually give in. Stop negotiating the price. It's a freeing experience to totally commit. When you totally commit to a relationship, to a business, to your fitness, to your faith, it's a freeing, powerful, it's almost like removing kryptonite from your life when you totally commit. Can you do that? The people around you always talk, it's costing too much. It's costing too much. And you're going, hey, maybe it's costing too much. You gotta start going, no, it's worth it. It's not the price, it's the worth. It's a subtle distinction in your life. That same scarcity mentality we do in going after our dreams. We want to acquire our dream. You can't be in price tag mode. What's it cost? What's it cost? What's it cost? You never get what you want. Decide in advance what it's going to cost and then decide. Here's the subtle distinction. Successful people don't negotiate the cost of something. They negotiate whether it's worth it. That's subtle, it's very subtle. If you're a person who's always thinking about what it's costing you in the sacrifice towards your dream, you're always gonna be negotiating it. But if you can decide in advance that the cost is worth it, the negotiation stops and you go execute. What I'm telling you is if you really want something bad enough, it's worth it, it's worth it. So start to feed yourself the worth question over and over and over again, not the cost question. Cost is a distraction. Worth is a focus mechanism. This is so worth it, it's so worth it, it's so worth it. Focuses you. Cost distracts you. I found with the people, I just want you all to know, what are some of the little secrets that successful people have that they might not even be aware of? The, the people I've really connected with when I've done the show, they have massive reasons. Their reasons are emotional to them. They're not just like big, like I want a beach house and a big ocean. Yep. Usually the biggest reasons are other people. The thing that will just never leave your spirit or your heart is who you want to be to show up in your life for other people. Now I've got a very special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you get motivated, inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through. But when you get motivated, inspired, and you create a plan of action, you have a over 90% chance of following through. And when you share it with other people, it jumps to 95% chance your likelihood of following through. And so I want that to be you from this video. We don't just watch videos here, Believe Nation. We do something, we take action. So I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Leave it down in the comments below because I wanna celebrate you. I want you to know something. If you're gonna accomplish anything great in your life, anything, you gotta have a big dream. You have gotta, it starts with that, it starts with a big vision. Napoleon Hill talks about that so much in Think and Grow Rich about the need to begin with the end in mind. So many of us get into business, I don't know why you got into the business you're in, particularly if you're in my business, but I hope it wasn't just to win awards or to get accolades or to be number one at something, but that you're beginning with the end in mind. What is the end gonna look like when you're finished? Is it gonna be financial independence? Is it gonna be a particular home you want, enough money saved you can take care of your children or your family? What is your big vision? What's your big dream? What's the compelling reason you're gonna do this? Because in anything great that you're gonna do, there's huge adversity, tremendous, which is why most people never accomplish anything. When adversity hits, they can't handle it. Or when it hits the second or third or 300th time, 
they eventually acquiesce, they eventually give in, because what's happening to them is bigger and more prominent than where they're going and what the end would look like in order to put up with whatever this situation is they're going through. And so the question to you directly is, how clear are you about exactly what the end's gonna look like? How clear are you about your vision and your dream? And how big is it? It's gotta be huge. If you wanna see the top 50 I did on Mel Robbins, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. If you're in a situation where you should do something and the excuses roll in, you only have five seconds before the excuses win. Yeah.